Hi, today I would like to tell you a little bit about the different meanings a code um, can have or about different types of codes and I'm actually I've been reading a bit today in some older books and um, throughout the video I will also um, later on add some quotes um, because I don't want to read stuff here uh, aloud just to kind of uh, refer to this and I'm referring to chapter four in this book computer added qualitative data analysis theory and method and practice and there's a number of articles I will I also uh, often refer to it in my teaching, even though the book is from 1989. Because some of these more conceptual issues haven't changed since all these years. And um, we can always revisit uh, them and think about them also in light of the new tools we have these days. And chapter four is about the different functions of coding and analysis of textual data. And you will see we can extend that also to, to video data. I have an example here. And the chapter is written by John Seidel and Udo Kelle. <clears throat> and they advise about the two functions of codes and uh, maybe we find also some more. A code can denote a, a text passage containing specific information in order to allow its retrieval. Or a code can also serve to denote, denote a fact. And and this is already uh, kind of pointing out the difference here that we can code that somebody said it was very hot today, it was 28 degrees or 90 de uh, Celsius or 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which by kind of some objective type measure, we could say, well, that's fairly hot. Um, things like I got my degree in April of 2010, um, I'm, 25 years old and so on. These are things um, that are more or less objective facts that we can take in the data, but a lot of these um, information that we code are more heuristic devices. We just want to have a pointer that if we code it with happiness is not the key, as we can see here, is one of the code. Well, there's something about um, happiness is not the key in that particular text passage and that we maybe should also think about um, other terms uh, and so on. What I'm looking here is teacher and happiness um, example project. So it's not kind of a fact, it's just something somebody is saying and then we interpret it like that or it will help us to find instances that are very similar where people actually mentioned that um, maybe the key issue that we should talk about in the relationship of children is not happiness per se, but might be a fulfillment purpose in life and things like that. And if you have codes that are more heuristic devices or those gray code that we have here, um, a family has one child um, and that child is a daughter and it's fairly young and the person who's writing is male. Well, these are the more objective codes. So we can actually already see at this one passage that these two types of um, codes have been applied. And this is my way of also dealing or distinguishing between different types of codes that has to do with the alphabetic order in the code list. Um, I add this hashtag and made, and these are kind of social demographic codes. I um, um, they're just gray in my list of codes. This is a super code, so um, don't be confused that this is red. And then all my more heuristic codes, they are colorful. Yeah, so when I develop categories and subcodes. So over the years, I have to come also. Uh, to distinguish between um, these different types of code that um, John Seidel and Udo Kelles already are referring to in this chapter of 19, uh, in 1998. And in order to make the sorting and organizing easier, at some point I started to use a special character as a prefix. It doesn't have to be a hashtag, can be something else. And I just need to be pointing out here that the um, the social demographic codes here, I use them here only as codes because I have multiple people in one document. 
So all of these passages here between these dotted lines is one person. And that's why I need to code for that information. Similar with group interviews, I need to code each um, speaker unit also with sociodemographic information. If you have classical interview data, all these sociodemographic codes would um, be document families, just so that you don't get confused. But you might have certain actors in an interview people talk about. Um, they talk about their grandmother, they talk about their father, they talk about their daughters, their teachers, and so on. So in that sense, it's also more an objective code. What they are talking about and how they felt about it and stuff like that. This is still, again, some more heuristic um, devices pointing uh, to something here. And in t terms of handling those codes, also in terms of analysis, well, I want to now talk about numbers. So in terms of analysis, Atlas does offer uh, you some quantitative output with the code core occurrence table, um, but also the uh, code's primary document table. So we do get numbers, but how should we interpret those numbers? Um, and for what type of data can we use them? So here then kind of the classical um, example um, for this project is kind of to compare the, for example, the definition of happiness of parents and um, those who do not um, have children. So given this is a small data set, um, I only, uh, will only use um, absolute frequencies. I can add the C coefficient here. Um, you see it's still, it's very small, um, but also I would not use it with such a small data set. Yeah, people have sometimes 3,000 cases if they import survey data, or just let it be 500. Um, but if survey data is much more structured and you may have more of these factual codes or codes that are coming from a deductive theoretical framework, and may, you may not have 250 codes that are more heuristic devices, then of course these numbers become more meaningful and also the um, C coefficient in, 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 uh, in a way in how to interpret it. So here I would not use a C coefficient because my data set is quite small here. But I could compare uh, in a sense the, the frequency here. This normally I should count relative frequency here because my group sizes are quite uneven. I have many more uh, respondents here who have children as compared um, uh, to those who do not have children. But so in that sense Given that data set, because I have a cross tabulation here of sociodemographic codes with some content codes, I can look um, into numbers. But if I um, relate more, I mean, two categories that are both on the level of heuristic devices, what you see now here is a code co occurrence table from another project where I've related codes that I would consider uh, on both levels for the columns and the rows being heuristic devices. Um, and here I would just use this table as a kind of an indication where there is something interesting in the data. Because the numbers are only as good as my coding. And if I've judged something, um, whether somebody said is a positive or negative appeal um, and in the words they have expressed it, well, that's already my interpretation. So I need to take these type of tables. I would not uh, kind of make now graphs uh, in Excel of these tables, but you need to look into the data and see what's behind the numbers. So that's the the um, the difference also in terms of interpretation and if you work with numbers um, on which level your codes are are they heuristic devices 
then I cannot take the codes as objective facts in a in a sense. Um, and I have to interpret those numbers with care. It's only, okay, this is kind of interesting. I've This occurs um, many more times um, as compared to another code. Maybe I've forgotten to use that the code. Um, could also be a possible explanation. So people like numbers because these tables are easy, um, of course. But what do these numbers mean? And you have to be very careful um, if you use a more interpretive approach. There are, of course, studies that have 30 codes. These 30 codes are very well defined and um, they probably come from the literature, from the theoretical framework, whatever, or, or more on the descriptive level. And several coders are coding uh, larger amounts of data material and, of course, need to then uh, code apply these codes uh, very similar, so you do integrated reliability checks and those kind of things. So if you have a study like that, then you hopefully have a coding system that you can rely on, that these codes are not just pointed to something, but they are more object objective uh, in the sense. And so um, the numbers can be more interpreted like statistics and you may draw little graphs and pie charts and bar charts uh, and so on and to present uh, tables as results. I would like to uh, show you one last project um, which doesn't have lots and lots of coded videos. So you see it's very densely coded and what you have seen here before this is 15 seconds now um, eight seconds and so on. So in these videos I have coded every gesture and mimic every time somebody opened the hand, closed it, whether they um, looked into the audience or whether they looked at their cards, yeah, it's a presentation. Uh, it's an analysis of Pecha Kucha presentations and I wanted to analyze um, what makes a winner in a Pecha Kucha presentation and what um, um, what type of presentation appeals to the audience. So that was kind of focus of this. And we, if we look at the codes, of course, I've also coded a bit for content, um, but it's more uh, for the gaze. Oh, these are German uh, codes here, but this is the gaze. And you see the frequency are actually quite high, even though I, so far I've only coded like six or seven um, presentations. And this is about gesture. And here the, um, the frequency chews up because this is also what well, I can observe in, in the video of that somebody opens the hands and I could of course also have a second coder verify my coding and see whether um, that second coder would also code that gesture to be meaning the same. So we could do some more objective checks on that and then of course numbers become more reliable interpreted in, interp so you can interpret them more like you also can interpret numbers and statistics. We won't get um, um, p-values or significant values, but then the c-coefficient might um, also become quite useful. And um, maybe I just give these a different color so it's easier to see. So I have the, the gaze and the gestures and now I relate those in a table. So I do the gestures in the, uh, the, the gaze in the columns and the gesture in the rows. And I do get higher frequencies uh, here now also in the table and also where these things um, co-occur. So here, of course, also my C coefficient becomes higher. The lighter the color, the stronger the relationship between this is the gaze into the audience and opening the hand so that some, some kind of seems to go um, together but also here this is um, having the folded hands or um, holding um, something on here that would be this and if they point out something, but that's more pointing something to a presentation, of course, um, then people look less into the camera. So what's very interesting, 
um, also with this data set, um, small, so we can continue to see the table. And now start setting filters. And I have three um, primary document uh, or number of primary document groups, families. And they are by content, but um, it's out of the um, image now because it's uh, too high. Um, those who scored um, top values in the presentation, so who, who were first, second or third place. So you see the numbers um, change. We even get a stronger relation. The frequencies, of course, go down because we have fewer data, but the relationship actually becomes stronger um, here if you focus on that cell. And now, just as a um, check, I do the losers, so to speak, or the also run, put it that way, so who, who didn't score um, very well. And so you see that um, the table changes and we get different numbers. Well, if in case you wonder this is happening, I would either need to double check, um, I mean, I would need to double check these kind of cells. The number is even nine here and the number is um, above one. But let me pause the video and I just um, double check, but you don't have to watch all of this, using the actually the coding analyzer, which will give me, uh, which will see, let me see if I have some, some errors here. But still, we get here some numbers that are not supposed to be there because the CISO coefficient um, in a statistical sense should not be above one because something cannot be stronger than 100%. But in qualitative coding, it, this can be the case. So these kind of things, they can, it's difficult to discuss them in about uh, five minutes. So this has been a bit longer now, but I hope I've given you a little bit of insight in terms of looking at your codes, whether they are more objective codes that code facts or whether they are heuristic devices that um, you need to look at in a different way and that you and then if you look at numbers, you cannot interpret the numbers in the same way as you can interpret statistics. They're just interesting pointers. And from those pointers here, you can go and click and look at the data and see what's behind it in a qualitative sense. Mm -hmm.